being plant-based around the holidays is not as difficult as people anticipate. Um, I think in terms of the menu, and speaking about Thanksgiving specifically, but also true for the December holidays as well, most people are excited about the sides. So when you think about Thanksgiving, even meat eaters will tell you that turkey is probably not high on their list of things that they really love. It's just part of like the tradition and part of the centerpiece of the table, but you can have lots of beautiful centerpieces for a table that aren't a bird. Hey everybody. Uh, it's so good to have you all here right before the holidays. Um, hi Dotsie, how are you? Hello, you know what, I'm, I'm still standing. I'm good, I'm here. <laughs> Excited to be uh, on. We have a real treat today, don't we? Mm-hmm, no doubt. Yeah. It's uh, not a surprise because they're seeing her name in the title, but I think the conversation will be uh, surprising and, and wonderful and everybody will go on a learning journey. We're gonna do something a little different today. Um, sometimes we, Dotsie and I, will chat before an interview. And today we're actually bringing our interviewee on with us uh, to chat and then um, about something that came up this week. Um, and then I'll introduce her. We'll go into our interview with her, but um, we thought she'd add to our conversation. Lauren, welcome, by the yes. way. Hi. Oh, she's with us. <laughs> so excited to be here. Oh, in a little bit. Um, Dotsie, tell, tell me a little bit about what appeared in the Wall Street Journal this week. Um, and we're we're taping just a week before this this drop. So it's November 12th, 2023 that this article came out. Tell us a little bit, a bit about it and why you wanted to discuss it because you are featured in it. Well, as you and a lot of our listeners know, Switch for Good fought really hard in uh, the edition of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans in 2020. And we fought to add soy milk in as a, air quotes, nutritional equivalent to dairy milk. Uh, it was about time that we got a plant-based alternative to cow's milk into the dietary guidelines so that for all of the people that cow's milk makes sick and for all the people who just choose not to drink cow's milk, they had uh, guidance on a macronutrient uh, profile that's very similar, almost exactly the same uh, as as dairy milk. So this time around, they they do side note, they do the, the uh, renew the dietary guidelines for Americans every five years. So this time around, we're in a we'll be in a big battle, if you will. I like to call them that because it, it it revs me up for competition uh, next year to suggest some new changes. And they start early and ask for uh, public comments. And they did that this year. Next year, we'll get as much of, of the public involved in writing in and trying to make changes. And so what Switch has decided to do this year is um, very similar to what Canada got accomplished in their last round of dietary guidelines. And that is asking for the dairy category to be removed from the dietary guidelines uh, as its own standalone category, because on my plate, uh, you literally have fruits, vegetables, grains, protein, and then this side dish of blue dairy, which is quite strange because broccoli is not its own food group. A beef is not its own food group. Rice is not its own food group. It's this one food group from the bovine mammal that is supposed to be its whole own, own food group. And so we're asking for the dietary guidelines to remove that and simply put dairy into the protein category. And there are a myriad of reasons, as many of our listeners could guess, but one a uh, big problem that that we have is a large percentage of the global population is unable to digest dairy uh, with much higher rates among certain ethnicities. And we have a very culturally diverse country now, right? It's not just white people. Let's just say it. Mm -hmm. And so placing a heavy emphasis on and dairy- Native Americans. Absolutely right. Who, not who, who right, are, not very, white who are very, um, very susceptible. Have a lot of lactose intolerance in there. Very feet. high among Native Americans um, in, in the in, in the ninety percent percent, um, and so I feel like placing heavy emphasis on dairy, uh, a food that is not universally digestible, or dare we say a cultural norm in all of the different countries all over the world and our own country, as you just pointed out, come from, it contradicts the goal of fostering 
what should be a healthy and inclusive dietary pattern because that's what the dietary guidelines are for. And so I got a call from the Wall Street Journal a couple months ago. They had heard my testimony and were uh, wanted to do an interview about why, you know, and and what and and and. Uh, so the article came out a couple of days ago, and uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, they pitted two Olympians against each other. I didn't know they were going to do this. So myself, who is, you know, stood up to say, you know, we need we need to make a change for fairness, for equity, for food justice. And then another Olympian who is a dairy farmer and drinks dairy, who is saying uh, dairy is wonderful and we should keep it right where it is in its own category. So that was the 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 article that was written. Um, I, I don't personally think it was that strong of, of an article. But the one thing that I feel like did come forward is uh, that the science is on our side, if I if dare I say our side. But uh, the other the 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 dairy proponent group and Olympian didn't provide any science. It, it was it was just anecdotal. Like I drink dairy. I think it helped. I think yogurt and cottage cheese specifically, she said, helped her to get back to running after she had a kid. Something that is very unscientific because I was thinking she probably mm -hmm. didn't stop it while she was um, having her kids. So she just continued eating the same thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was a, a, a an important factor. The, just um, before we bring in Lauren with her thoughts, um, mm -hmm. the, the title of the article, in case you all want to Google it, is Does Milk Do a Body Grow Good?, Two Olympians race to influence the answer. Um, so that was November 12th in the Wall Street Journal, which you sometimes there's the paywall. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be maybe on the Switch for Good site available at some point. Um, we will make sure to put the link that you don't need, the, that you don't see the paywall in our show notes. Okay, cool, cool. So people can see the article, yeah. So Lauren, you read the article too. Can you... Give us any thoughts on what you felt about the article. I mean, I completely agree that it doesn't make sense to put dairy in its own category with the argument that, um, yes, it has protein. So it, you know, technically falls within a protein category, but has all these additional supposed um, benefits or nutrients that aren't in some protein sources. But to Dotsie's point, plenty of foods have distinct nutrients that don't necessarily fit neatly within a category. Um, so I think that that argument for keeping it separate doesn't really hold when you consider all the other foods available to us. Um, the article also implies that you can only reach peak performance or prevent injury if you are including these things. And there are Many examples of elite athletes who do not consume dairy, uh, Serena Williams comes to mind, who are absolute athletic powerhouses. Um, and so for me, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense between the science and the anecdotal evidence. Um, I think it's very clear that you can reach top performance, um, avoid injury as long as you are eating a well-balanced diet, um, getting all of your nutrients from lots of different sources, um, not necessarily from dairy, and that dairy does not need its own category. Well, the article actually stated that a large study in 2020 that looked at all these different studies globally found that evidence does not at all support any kind of idea that dairy consumption reduces fractures. And I thought it was interesting that Elle Perrier St. Pierre, who was the other Olympian, not only did she finish 10th, and I'm sorry, Dotsie, you finished second, and I know that's just totally- <laughs> Well, petty, but you know, who's counting? <laughs> um, I have the I, same yeah, observation, I, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, she said she largely avoided bone injuries, and I thought, how many people have, what does that mean? Does, that, I mean, do a lot of athletes who supposedly don't drink milk have spontaneous bone, bone injuries? Um, running itself strengthens your bones. So yeah. um, I would think that that, that was just I, sort of a spurious I, I, argument. That might've really been the piece of this that piqued me the, or, you know, piqued my interest the most because by and large, it's fairly hard to break bones running. I mean, you have to fall and it, it, it rarely happens. That's just in that sport, right? Whereas cycling, we crash on the concrete pavement in basically a bathing suit. Uh, I know every cyclist I know 
has crashed some horrible way. Your husband has. I mean, it's it's you get hit by cars. It's 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 very dangerous. I have slammed down on my hip more times than I can count, and it is never broken. So I really put it through the test. I have broken my collarbone. That has snapped in half. That is a teeny tiny skinny little bone up here that connects right our neck with our shoulder. But uh, hip, I think everybody that cycles has sadly broke their collarbone. But but hip and elbow and arm and shoulder, they have oh they've slammed so hard and they've 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 stayed together. So I would would have wished she would have said that she's avoided bone injuries like and I've had. 10 falls that should have, you know what I mean? It's like, well, it actually said into- largely, it said largely avoid, avoiding right. injuries. It sounded right. like she might've had some bone injuries. Um, yeah. yeah, there so, you go. Right. I didn't even think about it that way. Say that her dietary choices are the reason why she hasn't broken a bone. It could there, be it's true. luck, you know, and there are plenty of people who consume copious amounts of dairy or normal amounts of dairy and break bones. So it, there's, that doesn't really prove anything. No. Um, I thought I I thought the article started off great because it started off with beautiful photos of Dotsie and strong arguments from her and then ended with the pro dairy message, which I find annoying because there is a um, credo in writing that of the bias of uh, recency, I think, which is the most the last thing that someone reads or hears or mm-hmm. sees is the thing that sticks with them. So I found that annoying uh in my and that's my bias but just wanted to note that i um is there anything else dots you want to say about the article before we move on to talking to lauren no but i'm glad we brought it up and um for those listeners who haven't read it we'll have it in the show notes and we would love uh to hear from you so go to our website switchforgood.org slash podcast and you can press the little microphone and uh and leave us your thoughts and a message about uh, this article and feel free to write to the Wall Street Journal your thoughts, actually. <laughs> yes. Christina Peterson, the writer, who's a lovely human, by the way, uh, her email address is at the end of the article. So that is a excellent point, Alexandra. If 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 10 of you would write in and and give and give your thoughts, that would be pretty incredible. Some activism also, going, folks. <laughs> yeah, and there's also letters to the editor at Wall Street Journal, you could also do too if you wanted to maybe get your letter printed. Okay, let me get on to our wonderful guest, Lauren. Thank you for your comments. Uh, And look forward to hearing more from you. So uh, folks, you're going to want to stay tuned in because our guest, Lauren Kretzer, today has an extraordinary tale. She is a vegan chef, a recipe developer, and a holistic nutritionist. Lauren has worked in Michelin starred restaurants. She's cooked privately for celebrities and she's been featured in magazines like Vogue and New York Magazine. Plus, her recipes are in some of your favorite vegan cookbooks. In 2020, however, while the world was being assaulted by a pandemic, Lauren was forced to square off against a rare and aggressive form of cancer. She chose to fight back with a holistic approach, and today, Lauren is cancer-free. So she has a message. Food can be our greatest healer. Dotsie and I are really interested to learn from you, Lauren, um, about what foods we should all be eating more of to be healthier and maybe avoid cancer altogether. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's start with your cancer story because... um, and then we'll talk more about your professional uh, life as a recipe developer and chef. Um, you were diagnosed in 2020 with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That was your cancer. And thank yes. gosh, you caught it early. Um, yes. And you have really great odds that it's not going to return. But share with us how you caught this cancer, because it's a blood cancer, as I understand, isn't it? And yes. um, so, and tell us a little bit about it, non-Hodgkin's sure. lymphoma. Sure. So the exact diagnosis that I had was um, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma called primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. So it's a a, a type of non-Hodgkin's that originates in your chest area. 
Um, usually by the time it's found, it's manifested into a pretty large tumor. So most people think that with blood cancers, you wouldn't have a tumor, but that's not the case with certain types. So this one um, typically presents as this big, you know, giant thing, like right near your lungs. Um, mine was caught in a very interesting and unusual way, which caused complications for me later on when I was trying to figure out what to do ultimately in terms of treating it. Um, so back in 2019, right around this time of year, actually, um, I had cold symptoms. I was not feeling well, but I had a baby at the time, um, a newborn and a toddler. So I was just putting off taking care of it, um, presuming that whatever symptoms I had were due to just lack of sleep. I was still feeding my baby multiple times at night and, you know, chasing around my my other little one. Um, so I just kind of let the symptoms go and they dragged on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, some of the symptoms were fairly severe. I was getting like really high fevers and night sweats and like all kinds of things that weren't normal, I guess. Um, so finally, my family urged me to go get it taken care of, get some medicine and be done with it. So that's what I did on a Saturday. I had my dad come over to help me with the kids. My husband was working and I went to urgent care and they said, you know, we're pretty sure that this is pneumonia. We just need to x-ray you um, to figure out, you know, how severe the pneumonia is and the type of pneumonia it is. And then we can prescribe you the right meds so you can be on your way. So they sent me into the x-ray room. I had an x-ray done, walked into um, back into the room with the physician and she had this very concerned look on her face and basically was like, um, I don't know how to tell you this and don't be alarmed, but you have a, a large mass in your chest. Um, at that point, I, you know, all the blood drained out of my, my face and I felt myself blacking out. And, uh, that was like the last thing I, uh, suspected that I, that I was dealing with. Um, I did have pneumonia by the way, as well. Um, so the, the size of the mass coupled with the pneumonia, they basically wanted me to go to the hospital right away. Um, so that's what I did. I quickly, um, got my things together, went to the hospital. Um, they got me on IVs for the pneumonia and sent me in for a CAT scan a little while later. And, uh, basically the CAT scan came back as inconclusive. It was, you know, grapefruit size mass abutting my heart. Um, and they just were like, you know, some features of this mass tell us that it's likely benign, but there's a lot of features about it that are suspicious. So you're going to need further workup. So basically for the next few months, I was sent to practically every test imaginable. I went to a heart doctor at first, did an echocardiogram, um, you know, an ultrasound. And she basically was like, I I don't know what this is. And you're probably going to have to see a thoracic surgeon just because of how giant it is and its proximity to your heart. So had to have MRIs, PET scan, um, all of the above. Everything was still coming back inconclusive. And the surgeon was like, you know, repeated what everyone else had said because of the size it has to come out. Um, at that point, I was just so eager to to get it out of my body that I was like, sign me up. I just, you know, want this over with. I wasn't thinking about, you know, the, the severity of the surgery or anything. So they scheduled me for March 10th, 2020, um, went into the hospital and had a thoracotomy. So they opened up my chest and took out this thing, um, sewed me back up and I was supposed to be in the hospital for like five days. And the next morning they basically kicked me out because of COVID. So, I was sent to recover at home. They literally took a chest tube out and I was in the car an hour later. So it was a very unusual um, dismissal after such a major surgery, but I was just really relieved. I was like, okay, it's over. Um, the, the mass itself looked upon extraction that it was not cancer. Um, so the surgeon was giving us lots of reassurances, which, you know, I appreciated. And, um, you know, he was correct in that eventual pathology came back. It was just a large thymic cyst. Um, but as a precaution, he took out my thymus gland, which is this tiny little gland in our chest that we don't need after adolescence. And the reason why he took it out is because, you know, in some cases, if um, if the mass had been cancer, some cases the cancer can spread to the thymus gland. So he took it out just to be safe. Well, when they took that to pathology, they found the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma there. So it's a very odd situation in that my cyst actually presented the way that this cancer typically presents, but it was not that. Um, it was a completely incidental finding. Um, 
when I got the diagnosis, I was floored. It was the last thing I was expecting to hear um, because I was feeling pretty good at that point and just total relief having the surgery behind me. And um, not to mention the pandemic unfolding, you know, I was still healing from chest surgery and then to have a deadly respiratory virus going around um, was pretty scary. (laughs) So that's how I ended up with my diagnosis. What was your emotional state? I'm, I'm journeying through the story with you and I'm thinking about being in the emergency room and going into the scan and, oh, we're just going to get a scan pneumonia. And are, are you glass half full or glass half empty as a person? And then with this, was it just like, did it crush you or were you going, okay, when they gave you the diagnosis, like, I, I can do this. I can, like, what were some of your first thoughts? I know there's a lot of people listening that have been diagnosed with cancer and many that are, you know, having and are afraid of it. Right. Right. Yeah. I think it can be a little bit of both in terms of glass half full, glass half empty. Um, I would say that for me, and I know for a lot of people that have dealt with cancer, uh, the uncertainty leading up to the diagnosis is far worse than when you actually have the diagnosis in hand. Um, and the reason why I say that is for me, my brain was going haywire. I was like, do I have lung cancer? You know, I've never smoked, but I'm just like, it's possible. You know, you see things happening like this. Do I have a stage four lung cancer? Do I have some other sort of horrific illness that's going to kill me, you know, within months? Um, I was diagnosing myself with everything. You know, I would be up late on Google and I know you're not supposed to do that, but it's (laughs) very difficult not to, um, Mm -hmm. especially as a mother. um, And, you know, without getting too far into my thought process because I don't want to be emotional. I was just like, I want to be here for my children. And there was a period of time where I was fearful that that was not going to happen. And I was fearful that my baby was not even going to remember who I was. Um, So for those months, I was unraveling, to be honest with you. Um, The probably the worst the worst mental state I've been in in my life. And then once I got the diagnosis, and had some information from various doctors and had some time to digest it and do some research, I started transferring my fear into a survivor mindset, which I think is crucial to come out of any difficult situation, especially illness. I think if you enter into a diagnosis feeling, this is completely out of my control and there is nothing I can do and I'm going to be a statistic and I only have a year or three years or whatever it is your prognosis is. People that think that way are making a bad situation worse for themselves. And, you know, I empathize and sympathize with people who are given far more dire diagnoses than I was given, but all the same, whether you have great chances of survival or poor chances of survival, I think you have to cling on to that hope and do what you can to improve your odds. Um, And that's what I did. You chose not to do a conventional therapy after your thymus was removed and Mm -hmm. decided to go more holistic. Can you tell us about that? What you, what choices you were offered and why you decided to do what you did? Sure. So after I was given my diagnosis by my surgeon, I met with the initial doctor at my local hospital uh, and he went through treatment options with me, which were chemotherapy. Um, He explained the type of chemo I'd be getting. And it was a very intense, um, seemed to me like a very intense regimen. I would be inpatient for a week and then just going back, you know, every few weeks. And, um, you know, that was very sobering and scary to hear. I still have the notes from that day. Um, you know, kind of just in disbelief that I was even having this conversation. It was over Zoom, of course, because it was during quarantine. And um, and then he said, you know, I have great confidence that your surgeon, you know, did a fantastic job removing it. And he said, and because the cancer was so early stage, I feel that if you depending on your your risk tolerance, if you wanted to do a wait and watch approach, I would be willing to do that with you. And he said, and, you know, as long as you submit to regular scans and coming in and, um, you know, just being under my surveillance, we we could work together because I had already expressed concern over the chemo and, um, you know, chemo, while it can save and extend lives, it also comes with 
some very serious risks. Um, specifically, you know, with with me, I was worried about heart damage. I was worried about being put into early menopause. I was worrying about secondary cancers. I would have also have had to have radiation, which comes with a lot of risks as well. So I, I really appreciated his advice and it was, um, it was a great relief, but I said, you know, I'm going to get a second opinion. And I was totally expecting the doctors with the second opinion to tell me the same thing. Um, I went to probably the number one, if not number one, then definitely a number two hospital in, in the country for cancer, specifically for, um, uh, blood cancer treatment. Mm. And, um, the doctor told me flat out, like, you're, you can't do wait and watch. She said, this cancer is super aggressive. She said, it can go from nothing to stage four within months. You know, you're really young. You have great uh, chances of tolerating the medicine well. Um, and, you know, we want to eliminate the possibility of you succumbing to anything. So no, we can't do wait and watch. And I was just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do because they were, you know, leaders in in the field. You know what? We're going to meet with a tumor board. We're going to present your case to like 12 or 13 mm-hmm. oncologists and we'll see what they say. I said, okay. So they come back and everyone said I need a treatment. So at that point, I felt like it was me against every expert with m- this one doctor who had some faith in me. And I decided to to go with him and um, he's still my doctor and he's incredible. And I, I feel like I owe my life to him because I've gotten to live my life since then. And while it hasn't come with its challenges, you know, I have a lot of anxiety around my checkups with him, um, which are getting better with time. Um, you know, I feel like he gave me a chance and it gave me permission to do research on healing holistically and making sure that this didn't come back. And that's what I've been doing. So I don't know if it's just what I've implemented or luck, but in any case, I'm grateful to be here. So what have you done that you believe has helped you remain cancer free? I think that's what people really want to hear is those. Yeah. So I've been plant-based for 11 years now. So I've been vegan for 11 years. So I was vegan before my diagnosis. Um, cancer obviously can be caused by many things. It's not just a dietary illness. Um, it can be caused by environmental factors, lifestyle factors. So what I was forced to do is to look at my life from a 360 degree angle, see what was going on with me emotionally, um, intellectually, physically, environmentally, all that stuff, and kind of picking apart my life and finding cracks. So that's what I did. Um, The first thing that I looked at was my diet. And while my diet was very good, I felt that it could use improvement and it could also use a heavier emphasis on disease fighting foods. So I, it was easy at the time because I was home in quarantine. So there wasn't the temptation of socializing at restaurants or, you know, going out. So I was cooking a hundred percent of the time for myself. And I had lots of time because we were, you know, trapped at home. So that was definitely to my benefit. Um, I researched all the cancer fighting foods, um, a really heavy emphasis on dark leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, dark berries, uh, turmeric, mushrooms, garlic. Um, those are my favorite anti-cancer foods. There's lots of science to support their cancer fighting and cancer inhibiting properties. Um, broccoli sprouts were something that just kept coming up time and time again as incredible, should be patented in the pharmaceutical industry, um, a cancer fighting food, and they're very easy to grow at home. Um, so that's something I got really into and I'm still sprouting to this day. I have a jar of them on my counter. Um, and those are the things that I was just adding into my diet in abundance. So making these huge salads every day with all of these different components of lots of the things I just mentioned, um, and then removing a lot of foods that were potentially causing inflammation. So processed things, I was never really a huge processed food person, but, you know, I have a weakness for tortilla chips and some things with, you know, more refined oils would sneak itself into my diet here and again, some fried foods here and again, and I made sure to to nearly eliminate them. Um, I had them occasionally, but they were no longer like a weekly part of my diet. Um, Alcohol was something that I was having, like I would say a good handful of times a week, reduced that um, significantly to now, you know, only having one or two glasses of red wine a week. And that's something that is a work in progress. I'm constantly trying to 
refine and reduce that um, cancer. Uh, uh, alcohol is a carcinogen. So, you know, definitely if you don't drink, don't start. And if you do cut it back as much as you possibly can. Um, so those are all things that, you know, I've been working at with, with my diet um, in terms of my lifestyle, my stress was pretty bad before my diagnosis um, oh. dealing with, you know, the addition of a new baby into my family um, was a huge adjustment as it is for, for most families welcoming in their first or second or third child. Um, I was having a lot of uh, breastfeeding issues and putting just intense pressure on myself to, you know, breastfeed for a certain length of time exclusively, um, you know, the science backs all that. So I was really white knuckling it and, and it was having a big emotional toll on me. Um, as well as other things going on in my life, interpersonal relationships were causing a lot of stress and a lot of, this was all unchecked. I was not in therapy. I wasn't doing anything to really manage it. I was just kind of getting through. So I started to meditate, um, that's a practice that I've, you know, been toying with for well over a decade, but it's never really clicked. And I just kind of took a beginner's mindset, like tried to do it without a perfectionistic mindset, just doing five, 10 minutes at a time and eventually built up into a regular practice. Um, and then the last piece for me, aside from diet and stress was time in nature. I feel that nature for me has been incredibly healing. I'm really lucky to live across the street from a nature preserve in my town. Um, thankfully, there's science to back that too. But even if there wasn't science to back it, I would still tell you that it's healing <laughs> because I can feel my nervous system just like relax when I get into the woods. So I would go on hikes nearly every day and, you know, take out my headphones and just listen to the sounds of nature. And um, I, I feel like that's made a big difference for me. I'm glad you brought up broccoli sprouts back in the diet section because breast cancer surgeon, Dr. Christy Funk, I think we talked about broccoli sprouts for like 20 minutes when she was on oh, yeah. the podcast. It was, it's like, it's crazy how they're just this little tiny foods, right? They're like little tiny sprouts and just some of them are are, are so incredible in, in fighting disease. But yes. that was a great stretch yeah. of diet, reducing alcohol, uh, you know, take better, better your care of yourself. I was very interested when you started talking about stress, because I'm thinking a few of a few people in my life that I think they've got the diet thing down, they've got the exercise thing down, but they're very stressed for a variety of different reasons. And it's hard to know, you know, what to do. Cause it's right. right. You know, the diet, well, it's what I put in my mouth. It's pretty simple. Right. It's pretty straightforward. Stress right. is just, it's, it's so multifaceted and for so many reasons, but um, I, I love that you just started meditation. Like I, I think I, I can really relate to it. It's like, I've kind of done it here and there. It's like been in my sphere, but like, I'm not, I, I don't, you know, it, it would take something really, uh, intense for me to go, okay, I'm going to do this every day, but yeah. you just grabbed hold and said, okay, what can I do to really calm the, the, in the inflammation in, in just, it's almost like life inflammation in a way, yeah. uh, and time in nature. Did you also start therapy? Cause you said you hadn't done it before, but did, is that something that you brought in as well? Yes, eventually. I didn't do it right yeah. away. But, um, you know, since it was during the pandemic, again, it was difficult to, especially, you know, given that I had had chest surgery, I was just like really terrified of getting sick with COVID. So um, I didn't really want to be in anyone's office. So I tried those, um, a few of the online help apps. Um, I think BetterHelp mm -hmm. is one, and there might be a couple others. And they were a good way to kind of get my feet back into therapy. I'd been in therapy in the past and a lot of time had lapsed. And so um, they were a good way to kind of get back in. But ultimately, I don't know if it was just a personal thing um, or not, but it just wasn't working. It wasn't really helping. So eventually I found a great local therapist who did Zoom uh, counseling. So I ended up with her for, for a while and she really helped me navigate a lot of the stuff that had been causing me stress beforehand and helped me navigate the new stress of a cancer diagnosis, um, which, you know, was essential because that was just such a stressful time for everybody. I feel like who, who didn't have a stressful 2020, 2021. So to have all this compounded on top of that, was, it felt, it felt like it was life or death for me. Like I, I had to do some meditation. I had to get into therapy. Otherwise I wasn't going to make it. 
Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. What would you recommend to people who need to listen to what you said about lowering stress? And then what do you do every day that are non-negotiables for you to stay balanced and healthy? Because you are so busy. Well, I would say to the to the stress piece, you know, we're never going to eliminate the sources of stress. I feel like it's kind of like whack-a-mole. As soon as something is going right, something else goes wrong. Some of us have stress that is chronic. You know, some people have deep-seated trauma that's not going away anytime soon. So I would say don't try to eliminate necessarily the source of stress, of course, unless it's something very fixable. You know, if if you, you have a friend that's really toxic, you know, that's easier to deal with than, you know, a chronic illness or, you know, being in a bad marriage. Um, so certain things are fixable. Certain things require, you know, more time or maybe necessarily aren't immediately fixable. So I would say instead focus on coping with the stress, finding ways to bring yourself down when you find yourself in that fight or flight situation. Um, that could be breath work. That could be uh, tapping. Some people have tremendous success with tapping. There's a lot of information online and videos on how to do that. That could be an exercise regimen. And I would say even 10 minutes is better than nothing. And I know that that's kind of canned advice, but a lot of people hear that and dismiss it and don't actually try it. I think if you do 10 minutes a day, it's one of those things where you do 10 minutes and then you're feeling better and you start working in 15 minutes and sometimes you have time that you didn't realize you had to devote to these things, or it just becomes a priority. Whereas in the past, it, it was not a priority. Um, you know, surrounding yourself with positive people. Um, if you are surrounded by people who are constantly complaining, who are constantly being toxic about everything in their lives, you're going to be biased to kind of look at your life from that angle. So I find that the more I'm around positive people, and I'm lucky to you know, have a very positive uh, partner. I'm lucky to have a positive family. Um, I feel that my outlook is generally better. Um, and I think having something, this is, you know, easier said than done, but having something to live for, you know, I had my, my children, so, and have my children. So I thought all along, I have to be okay for them. I can't be a good mom to them unless, I'm able to deal with everything that life throws at me. And God knows that wasn't the end of it, that whole cancer journey. You know, the new things have cropped up, new things will crop up down the line. But now at least I have some tools in place to to cope. And I think just putting emphasis on your own self-care. If you don't make time for yourself, the saying goes, you will have to make time for your illness. Um, and it's a lot more time consuming to be sitting in doctor's offices, getting treatments or getting scans or waiting for results than it is to get on a treadmill for 15 minutes or just go for a walk around your block after dinner. Uh, right in line with the self-care you mentioned a moment ago that you're working on lowering your alcohol consumption because it's a carcinogen. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not great for the cancer growing category. Right. Do you have a, are, are you currently doing a, a plan, you know, your own plan, if, if any, you know, where it's like, okay, 50% cutting down or a third or only on Saturdays, or if you found something that works for you to begin to lower it or already have, have, having lowered it quite a bit. So the good news is, is that as I've gotten older, the desire for alcohol has just naturally lessened. Um, I think most people mm -hmm. would say, as you get into your thirties and forties, you just cannot <laughs> deal. You can't hang like you used to. And 
that's definitely true for me. You know, I used to be able to drink a lot in college and I did drink a lot in college and function the next day. And now I'll have like two glasses of wine and I like do not want to get out of bed. Um, so because I'm a mom and because I have a job, I, I have to function and I have to feel decently. So that's been the easiest way for me to cut back is just anticipating. I am not going to feel good tomorrow. I'm not yeah. going to sleep tonight. Um, so that's motivation. The first, yeah. And then I also just have flashbacks of sitting in those doctor's offices and getting the diagnosis and talking about chemo. And if I'm tempted to drink more, I, a lot of times I think, is this really worth it? Because this will, this will increase my chances of being in that place again. Um, so I have a healthy amount of fear around alcohol uh, now. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, I do allow myself the one or two glasses of wine a week because to me, I feel it's not saying I'm going to have this forever, but for now, this feels like something I'm allowing myself as I make that transition. You know, I know a lot of the blue zones have red wine, um, you know, as a limited part of their daily lifestyle. So yes, there's a little bit of justification involved, but right now I feel like I, I don't do well with black or white thinking. So it's always been best for me to take baby mm -hmm. steps. That's how I, that's how I ultimately became vegan. I, ate cheese for a while. Um, it was the only exception I made was cheese pizza once a week. And, you know, a lot of people, maybe the vegan police would have come at me and said, you're not really vegan. But, you know, for me, I was like, something is better than nothing. And that's how I feel with alcohol. I'm getting there and I'm already, you know, drinking less than I was during the pandemic. So, um, yeah, I think if it works for you to have parameters, for me, the weekend is a good parameter to have. Um, otherwise, it just kind of sneaks in. You know, you're like, oh, my favorite show's on or, oh, I had a hard day today or, oh, my girlfriends want to come over. And like all of a sudden there's excuses everywhere to drink. Um, and I think just living life and realizing I can relax without alcohol. I can have fun without alcohol. Yeah. Giving your chance giving yourself a chance to learn how to do those things sober um, is what's ultimately going to help you get to the place where you don't need it anymore. Or you don't need as much of it anymore. Yeah. Those are helpful tips. I, uh, in, in trying to reduce uh, for me, it's, it's been a drinking slower. Mm -hmm. I could just drink like two glasses, like slam bam. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> true. like, Oh shoot, that's they're gone. So much, much slower, savor and enjoy. Cause like you, the older I get, you know, it's like you feel it more, but I, the, also the older I get, I can af uh, afford more than I could in my twenties, really, really good wine. And I like the really good stuff. And so yeah. it's like relax and savor it and spend time with it. And then that second glass sparkling water yeah. that I definitely have. And I think it's, I, maybe I've always been this way because I was a smoker for 14 years. I've got that like hand to mouth addiction. Yeah. So now I have it with a wine glass, but it doesn't have to be wine in the wine glass yeah. oddly. Right. Yeah, so those sure. tips have helped me. Yeah. Yeah. I do a, I do a mug of tea at night. Like <laughs> this is not wine. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear. That kind of show. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many good, like non-alcoholic seltzers now, like the recess yeah. will have like adaptogens and CBD. So you kind of like feel like you're, you're having something, but you're not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hear you. I love, I'm not going to lie. I love red wine. I really do. And like you, I can put it down if I'm not really careful about it. Um, but you know, now I feel, you know, comfortable with what I'm having and I feel like, okay, I'm not, I'm not overdoing it. And, you know, the one or two glasses a week are probably not putting me into super high risk category. And I am trying mm -hmm. my best to offset, you know, that behavior with lots of other healthy habits. So again, if I'm not trying to justify, but I'm also trying to recognize like doing, doing something is better than nothing, as I said before. Yeah, maybe right. we could put broccoli sprouts in our wine. Yes. We can have more. <laughs> Lauren, you had two vegan pregnancies. Is that right? Yes, I did. I'm sure a lot of people uh, listening would like to know what what are some tips that you would tell people who might be interested in doing the same thing? Because a lot of vegans are worried about pushback from others. So they'll give in or they're just worried because their baby, they feel like, well, I'm vegan, but my baby doesn't get to choose yet. So, you know, they're just not confident in the decision. Tell us what, uh, some things that might make them more confident. 
Sure. So the first is that there have been studies to show that a, a, a well-planned plant-based diet is healthy at, through all life stages. And that includes gestation all through old age. So a fetus can absolutely be healthy with its mother being plant-based. Just to note that you said well-planned. And I think that's the thing that makes people go, well, yeah. what? you see, you have to plan. I but know, the truth know. Is, is that any diet has to be planned yeah. yes. for it to be healthy. And so I always chafe when I you said, people yeah. you assume <laughs> that the, the omnivore diet doesn't have to be planned for the kids. I know, I know. <laughs> it drives me nuts too, because <laughs> as vegans were expected to have like calculators for the amount of protein we're having. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think well-planned just means being intentional about having lots of different nutrients in your diet. So, you know, just as it's unhealthy for an omnivore to eat only pasta during their pregnancy, it's also unhealthy for a vegan to eat only pasta during their pregnancy. So make sure you're including a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Make sure you're including plenty of whole grains, um, protein sources such as uh, chickpeas, lento, lentils, legumes, um, any bean, nut, seed, all of those things are great sources of protein, even though protein exists in practically every food. If you want a more concentrated source, um, make sure to include those things. They're also packed with iron. Um, eating lots of veggies are full of uh, folate, which is super important in pregnancy. So I think just trying to eat the rainbow, trying to eat a wide variety of foods, keeping the processed stuff to a minimum, um, is going to pretty much guarantee that you're getting everything that you need. Um, if you're nervous about it, you could always have some blood work done before you get pregnant to see where you're lacking and then make sure that you're boosting your diet with foods rich in those categories of things that you might not have or make sure you're supplementing properly. Um, chat with your doctor, preferably a doctor who supports a vegan pregnancy. Um there's a lot of obstetricians who will work with you and who will be, you know, excited that you're going this route. And there are others that will be naysayers from the get. And those are not the ones that you want to be with because they're going to basically use scare tactics to get you to do something that you're not comfortable with. And, you know, I'm living proof. There's many women out there who are living proof that you can have a very healthy pregnancy. I will say, I don't know if it was a result of my diet or just luck. I had minimal uh, unpleasant symptoms of pregnancy. So I actually felt pretty good um, throughout both of my pregnancies. And my babies were very healthy, um, born on time, seven pounds and change. Um, so, you know, these weren't like tiny little mal malnourished little things. They were great. And um, from day one, lots of energy <laughs> to this day, <laughs> they're very healthy. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that if you want to have a plant-based pregnancy, you can absolutely do so. Uh, I'm really interested in your thoughts on mom fluencers. I didn't even really know that was a word. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a mom. So maybe I'm not running in the right circles, but that it, it, you talked about how uh, unhealthy it is basically to have this picture of happy kids, happy house, happy husband, happy everyone, everything's perfect and it's not reality. I mean, I think everybody's got to know it's not reality, but um, but I'm very interested for you to share your thoughts kind of on um, how that can be damaging to others who maybe believe the facade in, in, in their in their emotions, in, in their body, in their in their overall happiness. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought this up because it was something that I struggled with for a long time. Um, momfluencer culture kind of having this insidious impact on me that I didn't even realize was happening. Mm. Um, there's this one influencer and I won't name her by name because I overall think she's great and she does great work and she's spreading a very positive message, but she is big on the natural home birth, um, breastfeeding until your kid's like 19 years old bandwagon. And like I said, I, I believe that if you can breastfeed your children, you should, you should try it. You should try it out. And it, for as long as it feels good for you and your baby, that being said, breastfeeding is such a complicated thing as women come to realize once they're doing it. Um, I don't think anyone can really prepare you for how difficult it is, both from a physical standpoint and from a psychological standpoint, it is a, an around the clock job and it limits you um, in every way. It's a beautiful gift to give your child, but you know, it, it comes at a cost and it's not always easy. Um, I came to realize 
throughout my two um, breastfeeding journeys that I have an an, an anatomical issue that prevents me from provide, um, producing sufficient milk. And I did everything. I did the pumping. I did the supplements. I did the round the clock on demand feeding, all that. And it just was not, it wasn't happening. Um, I white knuckled breastfeeding for a year and change with my firstborn and was devastated when, you know, that relationship ended. And then with my second born, we only lasted like four or five months before I had to supplement with some plant-based formula. And it was really hard for me. Like I said, I, I, it played into my stress leading up to my, um, my illness, um, because I thought I was being a bad mom. I thought I was failing her because I had seen women, you know, show, look at all my extra milk, you know, they're like giving it away. And here's me, I like literally couldn't pump like two ounces. And I'm like, I'm a failure. There's something wrong with me. And um, it was, it was awful. And I came to realize, thankfully, through reading other women's stories that there's a lot of reasons why breastfeeding doesn't work out. And your child needs you, they need your love and they need proper nutrition. And there's a lot of ways for a child to get that. And you just do your best. Um, so that's just one example. And in terms of like the diet, the same thing, you know, not every child is going to want to eat kale salads when they're three years old. It's just no matter what you do from the, from the beginning, a lot of these moms will have you believe if you give your child this from the time they're a toddler, they're going to love it. And my children are proof that that is not true. <laughs> I made um, a pasta dinner the other night with like a like a spinach pesto on it. And my little girl, my four year old looked at me and she said, I will not eat this green dinner. So, you know, it's just <laughs> it is what it is. Like kids are kids and you can look at women online and they might have it all together. But a it might not be what they're presenting. And even if it is, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That must be really tough. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about since the holidays are coming up about some of your, and you are a, a recipe developer, a chef, and you uh, just so involved in that space. Um, maybe you can help people get ideas for the holidays. Yeah, sure. So the holidays are one of my favorite things to talk about um, because not only because I'm a huge holiday person, but because I feel that being plant-based around the holidays is not as difficult as people anticipate. Um, I think in terms of the menu, speaking about Thanksgiving specifically, but also true for the December holidays as well, most people are excited about the sides. So when you think about Thanksgiving, even meat eaters will tell you that turkey is probably not high on their list of things that they really love. It's just part of like the tradition and part of the centerpiece of the table, but you can have lots of beautiful centerpieces for a table that aren't a bird. Um, you know, I personally splurge for a beautiful floral arrangement that day, um, which I normally don't do, but I will, you know, go all out on that. And then I'll make sure that I have gorgeous dishes of lots of other abundant things on the table. So we still have mashed potatoes in my family. We just make them plant-based. Um, we have vegan stuffing, we have vegan green beans, we have cranberry sauce, of course, which is naturally vegan. All the traditional Thanksgiving dishes can be made plant-based. There are thankfully countless recipes online right now, um, which was not the case when I first became vegan. There was probably like one or two blogs that were exclusively vegan and um, some of the recipes weren't that appealing. So now there are so many choices and in terms of an entree, if you really need that centerpiece, you can make a lentil loaf, you can make um, a mushroom wellington, there are uh, beautiful plant-based lasagnas to put out. Th these are all things that a meat eater would enjoy or could enjoy. Um, same thing's true for the December holidays, plenty of choices out there um, for recipes. And I would say in terms of the social aspect of it, you know, when someone goes plant-based, there's always going to be family members or friends that push back, who might make jokes, who might make you feel uncomfortable. And, um, you know, my advice would just be don't play into it. You know, if you come back with your list of why, you know, everyone should be vegan and why, you know, this is better for everybody, chances are it's just going to result in an uncomfortable back and forth and a debate. And you can have that debate just maybe another day. Um and I would say, just enjoy your food. And if no one wants to eat any more for you, more leftovers for you. And if they do try it out, then that's great because they'll probably say, oh, this stuff is actually really good. The stuffing in the mashed potatoes and even um, 
like, uh, you know, sauteed, you know, green beans or corn or carrots, it all, most of those are all just changing out the butter to plant-based butter, right? right. I mean, is there, right. there's nothing else in them yes. unless you put sausage in your stuffing or something like I think my grandmother right. did, but so it's just earth balance or Miyoko's yeah. butter is the only trade out, right? Yeah. That's so I simple. Use, I use Miyoko's butter in my uh, mashed potatoes. I try usually not to use um, <clears throat> processed uh, packaged foods and the majority of my diet, but on Thanksgiving, I will use something like a Miyoko's butter and you truly cannot tell the difference between yeah. that and a dairy-based mashed potato. And same thing for the other things. Like you said, if you're usually using turkey stock in something, there's mushroom stock, there's vegetable stock. Um, there's so many other ways of getting that flavor. Um, miso paste is a great way of adding umami yeah. to lots of things. So I feel like the more comfortable you are with cooking plant-based, the more you can easily adapt an omnivorous recipe to be vegan. And if you are new at plant-based cooking, like I said, there are plenty of already vegan recipes out there for you. Um, I have some on my Substack newsletter for for uh, my subscribers from last year, 2022. Um, so you can always look those up as well. But yeah, there's there's tons online. Yeah. What do you like as a dairy, a milk uh, and a cow milk alternative? Like if there's a creamy Recipes. base. So in terms of like day-to-day milk replacement off the shelf. I typically use an unsweetened plain soy milk. Um, for me, that's got the the body and the nutritional profile that I'm looking for. But if I'm trying to do like a holiday recipe, like a mashed potato, um, I will typically make my own cashew milk only because it is so easy. If you have a Vitamix um, or a high powered blender, you don't have to strain anything. So when you make something like almond milk, you have to strain out the pulp. It's a little bit more laborious, but with cashews, you literally just put the cashews in the water. If you have a high speed blender, you don't have to soak anything and you just blend it on high for like a minute. And it makes like the most luscious dairy, um, non-dairy based cream that you'll ever have. And I, Put that into my mashed potatoes with the Miyoko's butter. And like I said, you cannot tell the difference. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a wow dish. Like we were, we were wondering if you were going to uh, take a, a dish to a dinner, you know, you're somebody else's hosting and you are vegan and you really want to impress everyone. Is there, is there something, some side dish that you're like, ah, you got to check this out on my blog because it's going to blow people's <laughs> minds. Because it's not salad, which is what, you know, meat eaters think that we vegans just yeah, gonna right, right. Oh, I know. Yeah. Actually on my website on laurenkretzer.com, I have a, a spinach and artichoke dip that Ooh. it is, it is so good. I actually can't make it that often because I will go through the whole thing in one sitting. I don't know if you guys used to go to like TGI Fridays back in the day. Yes. Their spinach dip was yes. so good at the time. I'm sure right now I would taste and be like, this is disgusting. But you know, when I used to eat it, I loved it. And I've been like dreaming of that ever since. And so I developed this recipe with that in mind. And I have to say, it's actually better than what I remember the original to taste like. Wow. Okay, everybody go to laurakretzer.com. It, it's worth the effort and uh, um, it actually freezes really well. So it's a good thing to try. What, you know, I read your sub, you mentioned your sub stack. And so I read a lot of your um, articles, which are really interesting. I recommend that folks go there and um, become members. Um, you you wrote about nonstick cookware. And since mm -hmm. we're talking about cooking and different dishes. Can you tell us what to avoid and what to use in its place? As some, especially someone like you must be especially sensitive because there's been a lot of talk about this, um, tef, you know, make, this, uh, the nonstick cookware being, um, cancer causing. Right. Right. Yeah. So a lot of cookware, a lot of nonstick cookware was traditionally made with Teflon and other coatings that can be cancerous, um, especially when they're used at a higher heat. Um, a lot of novice cooks I find do not do heat regulation very well, which means like a lot of, I just see, and I know I used to do this, everything's done on high, um, which is problematic for your food, but also problematic for your cookware. Um, for nonstick pans, it will help release those toxic compounds into the air and into your food. And also over time, the coating could start to chip and actually you could be ingesting pieces of this coating. So for those reasons, it's best to avoid that cookware. Thankfully, it's, you know, for the large part being phased out. Um, I would say look for, if you're looking for an affordable nonstick 
uh, cookware. Anything made with ceramic is a good bet. I like the brand Green Pan. They're pretty good. Um, Scan Pan is also very good. They're not uh, ceramic, but they also make a non-tox- non-toxic, um, non-stick cookware. Um, the downside to those surfaces is that over time they will stop being nonstick. Yeah. So it's not that they will become toxic. They just don't work as well anymore. You'll find like when you first get that pan, if you put tofu on it, it'll be like sliding all around. And like over a couple of years, you'll find that it's just sticking and it's not working as well as it used to. Um, There are ways to extend the life of your nonstick pans. So again, not heating it at a super high heat, never putting it in the dishwasher is going to help. Um, but you are probably going to have to replace that pan anyway after a few years. So uh, a well-seasoned cast iron pan is probably your best bet in terms of non-toxicity and for cooking performance and for longevity. Um, And they're actually pretty affordable. Um, So you can get a a cast iron pan and it will last you your entire life as long as you take care of it. Ceramic is very high performance, but will only last you a few years. Um, If you're looking for longevity, I would say a cast iron pan. Okay. And there, I've heard, I've had a couple of chefs tell me that, that, that there's toxicity in the cast iron. That's what I use. And I'm thinking, okay, well then what do I cook it? Um, Cause I, I know no nonstick and it, 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 but, but what would be toxic the, the iron itself over time or not over time? I don't, I don't know. Um, I think like if you're ingesting copious amounts of iron, it's probably not a good idea, but I would feel like if you're plant-based, that's probably not happening. You're probably Mm -hmm. just getting just the right amount. I haven't read anything to convince me that cast iron isn't a good idea. Um, If you're worried about it, they make enameled cast iron, which is Le Creuset, um, Staub, all those brands. They tend to be more expensive, but they are excellent cookware. Um, I own them because I just feel like with the amount of cooking that I do, Mm -hmm. I can justify the price. And I take a lot of comfort in knowing that there's nothing you know, about them, that's going to hurt me. Um, But again, they're more of an investment. So if you're looking for something at a lower price point, the cast iron is the way to go. If you're willing to spend a little bit more and you want something that's a little bit easier to clean, um, the enameled cast iron is a good bet. We forgot when we were talking, oh, sorry, Dots, are you going to talk about cast iron? Because I wanted to go back to food. Yeah, Yeah, forgot a very important component of the meal, which is dessert. (laughs) Lauren, you don't sound like a dessert person, but no, I like literally uh, forgot. (laughs) But I am. That's really all I care about. (laughs) Thanksgiving, I would really just like to just eat the dessert, but that's not socially acceptable. So I do (laughs) eat the vegetables and stuff. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what I was teasing my mom about, that I was really just cared about the dessert. So yeah, I don't know, whatever she wanted for the for the vegetables and the wine. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. So for dessert, I mean, the holidays, it's it's really easy. Again, if you're willing to use the plant-based butters, you can make a fantastic pie crust using a commercially bought um, plant-based butter. But if you mm-hmm. don't want to use the vegan butter, you can actually make pie crust with coconut oil. You can even make it with olive oil. The consistency is going to vary depending on the fat that you use. Um, if you're someone who does not want to use oil, um, I would say like a beautiful fruit crumble um, is something that you can do with some oats on top. Um, oats and slivered almonds is um, a really nice way to bring in dessert without relying on like a commercial butter or any added fat. Um, or you could do the crumbles with with vegan butter as well. Um, I've seen and made beautiful um, uh, like chocolate puddings or chocolate mousses made with silken tofu. I've seen them made with avocado, although I haven't tried those yet. Um, So there's a lot of recipes, again, online for beautiful desserts that you can make without any animal products. And to me, they're better because I find that when I do indulge in dessert, when it's plant-based, I don't feel as bad the next day. Um, I'm very sensitive to sweets. And just like alcohol, a lot of times just the anticipation of how I'm going to feel is enough to get me to just pass it up. But when I do indulge, I feel like if it's made with wholesome ingredients, I don't suffer quite as much. Can you tell us the books where some of your big hits are because you're a recipe developer? So I'm actually not in print yet. I actually do recipe development mostly for clients um, in online programs. So right now I work a lot with um, Dr. Will Bulsowitz, who's written Fiber Fueled. He does a lot of online programs for um for his for his fans and for his patients. Um, and basically I would say 
I think they're mostly my recipes, if not all my recipes in those programs. Um, I'm actually developing something new for him right now. So that'll hopefully be out, I'm guessing sometime in the early new year. Um, I also is it work a new on, recipe, a new program? Or what is always it? new recipes. And okay. yeah, it's going to be for one of his programs. So I'm actually right. working on those this week. And I will say they are very good if I do say so myself. Um, and I work on an ongoing basis for Chris Carr, who is also a New York Times bestselling wellness author. So she has a membership called Inner Circle Wellness. And it's a wonderful community um, of people who just want to lead healthier, better lives. And there's lots of things available in the membership, but one of the components are new recipes, new exclusive recipes. So I develop recipes for her as well. Um, anything that I do, whether it be for my private clients or for media or for my own website, always with seasonality in mind, health in mind, and to the extent that I can do it, simplicity in mind, because I know we are all busy. I... I feel like I love to cook and I will not make the recipe if I know it's going to take me like an hour and a half. So I feel like most people are like me. So I try to make sure that it's not overly complicated and that you can probably make it even if you don't have a lot of experience. So like a recipe developer, I'm not a cook even. So I'm, not a, um, I'm curious. I see, I have a picture of you in your kitchen concocting and tasting and, and trying different versions of the same you know, um, <laughs> chocolate chip cookie, for example. Yeah. Um, is that how it goes? What is it? Or, and do you decide, do you tell Will, hey, Will, this is what I think you should offer? Or does he tell you what he wants and then you give him the recipe? Like, how does it, how, what do you do? Well, it depends on the client. Some clients come to me with very specific ideas of what they like. Um, they might want me to feature a certain ingredient or follow a certain theme, or they might flat out be like, we need you to make a vegan mac and cheese. So, ranging from a concept to being very specific. Sometimes I get guidance from them, but more often than not, I I have the floor and I can pitch recipes to them, trying to keep all the things that I just mentioned in mind, seasonality, it being healthy, et cetera. So I try to think, when is this recipe going to be published? What are the fruits and vegetables that are going to be available to most people? Um, as far as the other ingredients, what can most people find at their supermarket, whether they live in Beverly Hills or the middle of the country in a very small town? I try to think about that as well. Um, if ingredients aren't available at a local supermarket, I try to make sure they're available like on Amazon or like a, you know, a website where everyone can order from. Um, so I conceptualize the recipe based on a lot of those factors. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from cookbooks. I get inspiration from dining out at restaurants, um, from my cultural heritage, from my travels. Um, those are all ways that I can think of new things to to come up with. And then, yeah, it's just like a process of tinkering in the kitchen. I'll start with a base idea of what I think I should do. Sometimes I get it right on the first try. Other times, especially with baked goods, it can take me multiple iterations. Everyone in my family wants to kill me by the end of the week because no one wants to eat any more freaking scones, um, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but, you know, I will not submit a recipe to my client until I am very proud of it or until I feel like I would serve it to company. Um, so that's typically how I conceptualize and, and execute. I will try a scone all, <laughs> all day long. Every I've the, That's the 99% British that um, 23 and me says I have in me. I think <laughs> the drier, the better. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. What a, what a journey. Th thanks for being with us and, and, and taking us on this, this, this complete uh, health journey, starting, starting oh. with your, with your own. And we're so glad that you're, you're here to fight many more years uh, alongside us at Thank this, you. the podcast and just in, in all that you do to Thank um, you. for the betterment of the world. And thank you for all you guys are doing. I feel like your mission is so incredible and well needed um, right now. And I appreciate you having me. And it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Great. We appreciate you thank so you. much. Thank you.